Archaic Records. Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Archaic Records here with you again. My name is Jamie, coming to you from Nashville, Tennessee. Here to wish you a very happy Morrissey Monday, a celebration of all things Morrissey and the Smiths. And seeing as today is October 21st, 2024, we are just 10 days away, assuming, of course, that everything goes as planned, from Morrissey kicking off his 2024 fall tour on Halloween evening out in Houston, Texas. Now, this is a tour that will run through November 23rd, making stops along the way on November 2nd in Dallas, Texas. On the 4th of November, Morrissey will be in Little Rock, Arkansas. Oof. Arkansas. I gotta tell you that I spent a week there one night. <laughs> the state slogan of Arkansas should read as follows. Arkansas. Keeping Dennis unemployed since 1836. The next show after that will be on November 6th in Birmingham, Alabama, a show that I will be in attendance at, at the Alabama Theater, a venue that I am very excited to check out. I'm always happy to be back down in the beautiful city of Birmingham, Alabama. Now, you may be asking yourself, hey, what in the hell makes Birmingham so special? Especially considering you just took a cheap shot at all the lovely people from Little Rock? I mean, what gives, fat boy? First off, I gotta tell you, that's very hurtful. You know, I'm doing what I can. I'm trying to drop some of this tonnage, if you will. But second off, Birmingham, Alabama is just a city that I happen to think is pretty snug. It's a city that I virtually knew nothing about until my wife and I moved out to Tennessee about four and a half years ago. And it is a city that, over the course of that time, we have made several trips down to. It is a city that, every time I visit, my opinion of it continues to grow. Birmingham, Alabama has a real cool sort of underground DIY, mom-and-pop neighborhood kind of culture, something that Nashville sort of lacks, at least in my opinion. It is a city that also has a couple of excellent music venues that we already have been to. One being a place called the Saturn, which to me is pretty snug, but really my favorite venue, at least so far, out in Birmingham, is a place called the Nick, which is this awesome, scuzzy little punk rock rat trap. It always makes me feel a little bit homesick for the West Coast because this is a place that you could easily imagine being in San Francisco, Oakland, Berkeley, Portland, or Seattle. So if you ever have the opportunity to check out Birmingham, I would jump at that opportunity because it is a great city. And if you happen to find yourself in Birmingham, be sure to check out a venue called The Nick. That place is the Jugs. Uh, the next night on November 7th, Morrissey will be in Knoxville, Tennessee. Uh, another show that I will be in attendance at playing at the Tennessee Theater. Now, I've never actually been to a music show in Knoxville, so I'm not exactly sure what to expect. Knoxville is the home of the big state school out here uh, in Tennessee, so I assume that it will draw a big crowd. Uh, the 9th of November, Morrissey will be in Durham, North Carolina, followed by Baltimore on the 12th. On the 13th and 15th of November, he will be in Newark and Atlantic City, New Jersey, followed by Rochester, New York on November 16th. Uh, he will make his only appearance up north of the border in Niagara Falls, Ontario on November 19th, followed by Flint, Michigan on November 20th. After that, he is in Indianapolis on November 22nd. That is a show that I'm also going to make an effort to be at. I sort of have to finagle a couple things with my work schedule, but if everything falls into place, hopefully I will be at that show in Indianapolis as well. Indianapolis is another one of those cities in the United States that's sort of a hidden gem. It's got a really cool kind of underground music and art culture, a real DIY value system I'd love. Uh, checking out Indianapolis every chance I get. So hopefully on the 22nd, that is a show that I will be at. The tour finishes the next night up in Waukegan, Illinois. Now, I'm not exactly sure what Waukegan, Illinois is specifically, but I can only assume that it is a suburb of Chicago. Chicago is a city that I lived in for a few years uh, back in the early 2000s, it's still one of my favorite cities in the country. 
Uh, never miss an opportunity to go to Chicago. I won't be going to that show on November 23rd, but hopefully I will be at the show in Indianapolis, and I will certainly be at the shows in Birmingham and uh, Knoxville. This is a tour that I'm very excited about. As always, I always get excited to see the big guy. I think this will be my 13th and 14th shows, respectively. I have not seen Morrissey since the 40th anniversary tour out here in Memphis and Nashville. Uh, last October, I had tickets for the Anaheim show at the beginning of this year that was set to celebrate the 20th anniversary of You Are the Quarry. Now, of course, we all are aware how those Los Angeles shows turned out, which led me to sort of hesitate when it came to purchasing tickets for the Las Vegas shows this summer, the shows that were uh, set to commem commemorate the reissue of the Beethoven Was Deaf uh, live albums. Those were shows in Las Vegas that I wanted to go to. I struggled with the idea of going. I had my wife's blessing. But for me, when it comes to my real life, my work life, that is an exceedingly busy time of year for me. And it was just difficult to justify taking the time off of work and the expenditure of traveling cross country for something as frivolous as a Morrissey show. Now, going to a Morrissey show is never frivolous, but when you weigh the pros and cons between working and not spending the money it takes to travel cross country and the fact that, to be honest with you, there was still a little bit of a sting uh, from the Anaheim show that got canceled earlier this year. I decided to pass on seeing the shows out in Las Vegas. Now, of course, those shows went off uh, without a hitch after Morrissey canceled the shows in Southern California at the beginning of the year. He promised, he guaranteed via his social media outlets, that he would be there in soak, in blood-soaked flesh, and he would play those shows to his, uh, you know, best ability. Which it appeared like he did. Those shows, uh, from everything I saw online and read, those shows were great. Morrissey looked great. He sounded great. And I got to tell you that, despite the fact that I didn't go to those shows in Las Vegas, I am a collector of all of the Morrissey swag. So as soon as those shows were uh, all completed out in Las Vegas. I went on to the Morrissey Web Store, the Emporium. <laughs> Get up. Emporium? I mean, come on, man. You can't buy wit like that. You just have to hope to be born with it. But I went on to the Emporium website in order to purchase some of the swag from the Las Vegas shows because despite the fact that I was not there, which I wasn't, I acknowledge... I'm still a collector. I still want all of the merchandise. I ordered a couple of shirts and the poster that were connected to the Las Vegas shows. And I, as of yet, haven't received any of my merchandise. Now, I've always had positive experiences in the past when it comes to dealing with Morrissey's web store. So I've sent off a couple of politely worded inquiries to the staff at the warehouse where Morrissey's uh, merchandise is distributed, and I have just received no contact, uh, no correspondence back as to the status of my order. I feel as if I have just thrown money into the abyss, farted into the tornado, as the people like to say out here. I don't know if you've had the same experience with your orders regarding the Las Vegas merchandise from the Morrissey web store, but in my experience, I ordered them in August, and I, as of yet, have not received the merchandise or any word on the status of my order. I'm not particularly happy about it, Steve. Perhaps it's time for you to put on a high-vis vest and a hard hat, get down into that warehouse, and start cracking the whip. Uh, anyway, apart from me being excited about this tour, which, of course, I am, I always am, uh, I think this is actually a somewhat important tour for Morrissey to at least close out 2024 on a bit, of, a bit of a positive note. I would say that this year has been somewhat of a mixed bag for Morrissey. Of course, we are all still mired down in the bonfire of teenagers. Uh, melodrama, a soap opera that has been playing out for basically over three years and has no end in sight as far as I can tell. It really seems as if We've reached an impasse here. It seems as if both Morrissey and the music industry have really dug in their heels, and we as the fans are sort of left in the middle just hoping that this record will eventually see the light of day. Now, I have faith 
that at some point it will, and then the record after that, which is supposedly already done as well. Uh, without music, the world dies. But man, it's just getting to the point with this bonfire of teenagers, you know, whole thing that I've just reached my limit when it comes to hearing about it. I'm to the point where it's like either put out the record or don't, but I just cannot listen to any more of the belly aching and the melodrama that has come with it over the course of the last several years. Now, of course, Morrissey has been pimping this record as one of the greatest records that he's ever made. I realize that most artists do that every time they release a new album. Personally, I'm a little bit skeptical. Not that my expectations are even that high for it. I mean, are you going to tell me that this record is as good as the stuff put out by the Smiths or put out by Morrissey during his peak solo years? I mean, a little bit skeptical. But that isn't necessarily my expectations. That isn't what I need. My hope is that this record will be at least as good as Dog on a Chain, which I thought was a very good record. I mean, I thought California Sun was a good record, too. Yes, I realize it was all covers, but I thought California Sun was better than Lone High School, and I thought that Dog on a Chain was better than California Sun. So that's my that's basically my expectations. I don't need this to be Viva Hate or Kill Uncle or Bone a Drag or uh, Vox Hall and I. Just put out a decent record. I think that that will do just fine. But, you know, apart from the whole Bonfire Teenagers melodrama, which I acknowledge has got to be so just utterly frustrating for Morrissey. It's got to be a horrible feeling to feel as if you have been blackballed and you are being censored and singled out. And uh, I can understand the frustration, but at the same time, I just I can't deal with any more of the soap opera of it. I'm just not a soap opera guy. I'm not a drama fan, to be perfectly honest with you. Uh, apart from that, you know, obviously Morrissey started off 2024 uh, by canceling the two shows in Los Angeles that were set to celebrate the 20th anniversary of You Are the Quarry, I mentioned before I had tickets for the Anaheim show. Uh, you know, this was a situation that I thought got handled very poorly by Morrissey. Now, I'm somebody that will typically defend 95% of the things that Morrissey says and does, but you have to be unbiased. You have to practice a little bit of impartiality, and I thought the way that that got handled was done very poorly. I thought the excuse given was relatively flimsy, and I feel like the fact that those cancellations were done really at the 11th hour uh, was just a really shitty thing to do. Now, I believe, or at least I want to believe, that Morrissey uh, has a an affection for his fan base. Now, I don't expect him to have the same affection for his fan base that we have for him. But it's nice to think that he is, you know, a little bit... Uh, at least respectful of his fan base. And I felt like the move that he did in the early part of this year when he canceled those two shows, uh, I think it showed a real lack of respect. For one thing, he gave a real sort of flimsy excuse as to why these shows were canceled. And the fact that he sort of waited till the 11th hour, I thought was pretty shitty. I mean, this was a big event. This was only two shows. Southern California and knowing the Morrissey fan base uh, as well as I do, I can only assume that there were people who were traveling from great distances to be a part of this event and to have the rug sort of pulled out from under you at the last second, I thought showed a sort of lack of respect for the fan base. Now, like I said, I typically try to defend Morrissey when it comes to most of the shit that he does and says, but I found that to be sort of inexcusable. Now, it's not going to cause me to not become a, not be a fan anymore. I don't know that there's really anything Morrissey could do, I mean, within reason, that would alienate me at this point in time. But I thought that it was something that was not done uh, very professionally. I can't help but wonder, because these were two big arena shows, I can't help but wonder if these cancellations were caused by soft ticket sales. Now, I don't know that, but Morrissey doesn't typically play these big sort of hockey type arenas. He's more of a theater venue act at this point in time. And despite the fact that this was a big you know, two-show event, you know, perhaps it's possible that the tickets just weren't selling like they thought that they might. And I've always wondered if that's why uh, the plug got pulled on these. But, you know, I'll never know, I guess. I don't know that it's been made public. I mean, of course, Morrissey's excuse at the time was that he was suffering from exhaustion and was on doctor's orders to get bed rest. I, I don't know. I find that sort of uh, difficult to believe. Following that, of course, Morrissey did play the successful, you know, two-weekend 
residency in Las Vegas, as I mentioned before, these were shows that I was considering going to at least one of the weekends. Uh, you know, there was still a little bit of bile in my mouth considering the An the Anaheim show had just gotten canceled not too long ago. Of course, Morrissey guaranteed that he was going to be there. He played great shows from everything I've seen and heard. And of course, these shows were to commemorate the reissue of the Beethoven Was Deaf live album, the first time it's officially been released here in the United States. Of course, I had it on the old import CD that you could buy as an American. But man, I got to tell you that I still love the Beethoven Was Deaf reissue. Pretty much ever since that reissue has been released, I have been listening to that record on exceedingly heavy rotation. That was already one of my favorite live albums of all time, but over the course of uh, the past couple months since that record's been reissued, it's pretty much not left uh, my turntable since I've gotten it. I have totally re-fallen in love uh, with that album, which, you know, to me, just kind of, you know, appetizes me more to get more of this sort of archive live material released if we've reached an impasse with the you know bonfire of teenagers record and then the record after that uh, you know without music the world dies i mean i'm all in on digging through the vault and getting some of these old tapes assuming that they're out there i'm assuming that there is a vault full of old Mar morrissey lar live archive material go out and release some of this material officially from some of these early tours and Morrissey's solo career. Go back and release shows from, you know, Viva Hate, Kill Uncle, Bona Drag, Vauxhall and I. I am all in on that. So if we have reached a point where we cannot get the Bonfire of Teenagers record released, man, you could release some of this material and keep me happy for a long time because it is my opinion. And yes, I'm biased. I don't pretend that I'm not. But in my opinion, when he's on, Morrissey is the greatest live performer in the history of rock and roll. And there's just, there's so much of that live material that's just got to be in a vault somewhere that I would kill personally to hear it released as an official professional, uh, professionally produced record. I'm all in on that. Uh, so I've been totally just geeking out on the Beethoven was deaf, uh, you know, reissue ever since it came out. Uh, apart from that, I do think that this is an important tour for Morrissey to go out and do, you know, basically what he does best, which is create music, uh, connect with his adoring public. Uh, like I said before, he is, when he's on, I think he is the greatest uh, live performer in the history of rock and roll. And the re relationship between he and his fans, I think, is unique. I think it's cool. I think it's special. I mean, I will always believe that Morrissey fans are among the most devout and loyal of any fan base in rock and roll. We are as crazy as any of the more notorious fan bases. Now, as a fan base, I've always maintained that I don't necessarily think that we are the tightest knit. I think there tends to be a lot of infighting and bickering within the Morrissey fan community because we are, at the end of the day, I think being a Morrissey fan by definition, I think you're just somebody that is a little bit more of an individualist and therefore, maybe not the best member of a community. I don't think that Morrissey fans are necessarily the most community-minded people in the world. So within our uh, subculture, within our little community of fans, there tends to be bickering and infighting, which is not to say that I'm not proud of the Morrissey fan community. I'm, in, I'm extremely fan, proud of the Morrissey fan community. I'm a proud member of the Morrissey fan community. And I think that we are as loyal and devout as any fan base in rock and roll, which is why it's always sort of been comical to me that there is this sort of attempt out there by the woke mafia to cancel Morrissey. I think people think if you're going to cancel Morrissey, if you're going to succeed in this campaign to cancel Morrissey, you are just hugely underestimating uh, the fan base. Most of us are not going to be, you know, pressured into deprogramming based on the opinions of others. Most of us don't really have that much respect for other people's you know opinions we are not the cool kids morrissey fans were never the cool kids we were always the outsiders i think most of us celebrate our outsider status and for me personally i don't really care what most people think and i assume that most morrissey fans don't care uh, what people think either so this is a great opportunity for morrissey to come back out and touch base with his fans before 
uh, the end of the year for me. As I mentioned before, these are my 13th and 14th shows at least coming up. Like I said, hopefully I can uh, hit the Indianapolis show on the 22nd, but I will be in Birmingham and Knoxville. On the 6th and 7th, I first saw Morrissey live back in 1997 on the Maladjusted Tour in San Francisco, California on October 8th of 1997. I'll never forget that show, one, because it was my first Morrissey show that I'd ever been to. So in some ways, it's still, although it's not my favorite, it's still a sentimental favorite because it was my first time getting to see the big guy live. I remember I went to that show with a friend of mine at the Warfield in San Francisco, California, and... At the time, I was living out in the East Bay, and he and I got into the city early that day, which was our sort of our routine on show day. We'd always end up going to San Francisco early, and we'd hit a few of the record stores. And I remember that we were on the tower; we were at the Tower Records, which at the time was on Columbus Avenue, I believe, in San Francisco. From I think that was the street it was on. It was a huge, awesome Tower Records. I still miss Tower Records. Uh, to this day, but I remember we were in there flipping around, and we'd gotten to the city early, and uh, I overheard two people talking an aisle or two over from where I was that they had gone to see Morrissey the night before, and I immediately panicked. I was just soaked in an emotional cold sweat because I thought to myself, there's no way I missed that show last night. Was it last night? I thought it was tonight. So, of course, back in these days, you still had the paper ticket. So I pull my ticket out, and it says October 8th, 1997, which it's October 8th, 1997. But I'm in a full-on meltdown at this point in time, at least in my head. Now, I'm keeping cool, you know, on the outside, but in my head is chaos. And I run and I grab my friend. I'm like, I think we missed the show. I think it was last night. So he and I basically skedaddle it downtown to where the Warfield is on Market Street, and we get down there. And on the marquee, it still says Morrissey. And come to find out, eventually, that Morrissey had played two nights at the Warfield in San Francisco on the Maladjusted Tour. Unbeknownst to me, I did not know that he was playing two nights. Had I known, I probably would have been uh, at both shows. But at least on the bright side, he and I got down to the Warfield so early that we were basically like second or third in line. And we had general admission floor tickets, and we got in there, and we were just right up close front and center to see uh, Morrissey for my first ever show uh, at the Warfield on the Maladjusted Tour. Now, looking back on it, apart from the fact that that is an extremely sentimental show, for me, that is a show that is probably one of my lesser shows in terms of uh, my Morrissey experience. In 2000, I saw the Oi Esteban Tour. Now, by this point in time, I had moved to Seattle. I left the Bay Area in 1999. I moved to Seattle, uh, and I saw the Oi Esteban Tour in 2000 at the Paramount Theater in Seattle. That show was awesome. I think that the Oi Esteban Tour was to promote the DVD Oi Esteban that came out. Of course, between 1997 and 2004, there wasn't any new albums coming out, so uh, it was not to promote any sort of new album. But in 2002 in Seattle also... I saw the Best Of Tour, which was interesting because uh, this was the show that, I remember this show distinctly because he played three or four shows or three or four songs that night featuring a uh, song, he played three or four songs that night that would later be featured on the You're the Quarry album, which didn't come out in two, 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 until 2004. But I remember thinking as we were leaving that show in 2002 that there were like several songs that I had never heard before, and I was so excited to hear them come out on the new album because even live in 2002, those songs were just the height of snugness. Uh, in 2004, I saw the You Are the Quarry tour twice. That was the only tour I ever saw twice until last year's 40th anniversary tour. To me, those are still the two greatest shows that I've ever been to in my entire life. Any artist, I can't imagine any other artist, any other shows ever dethroning those two You Were the Quarry shows that I saw back in 2004. One, because I just loved that album so much. I mean, when You Were the Quarry came out, it had been seven years since Maladjusted had been released. Now, there had been some compilations and stuff that came out during that sort of downtime, but as far as a new studio album, 
It had been seven years, and I liked Maladjusted. I still like Maladjusted. I saw the Maladjusted tour. But Maladjusted was an album that I think within a lot of, for a lot of people within the Morrissey fan community was a record that didn't necessarily connect everybody. It was a record that a lot of people had sort of mixed feelings about. Now, there are records in Morrissey's catalog that I definitely like a lot more than Maladjusted, but there are certainly records I like a lot less than Maladjusted. I mean, my least favorite Morrissey album of all time is the record that came out right before Maladjusted, which was Southpaw Grammar. But, you know, You Were the Quarry was a record that it just, not only did it, it you know, it unify the Morrissey fan community, but it, you know, it, it re-engaged Morrissey. It lit a fire back under his, you know, under his, into, into his career. And when you went back and you saw these shows live, I mean, he came out, he was just breathing fire. You could sense that he was excited. He was energized. This record had just shot a whole new life into his career. I mean, this was like the comeback kid back in 2004, and I saw this tour twice. I could not believe, I still can't believe, how good those shows were. Uh, in 2006, I saw the Ringleader of the Tormentors tour in Seattle. That was an album, Ringleader of the Tormentors, that as an album, it's still something that is somewhat disappointing to me just because You Are the Quarry is one of my top five favorite albums of all time. And Ringleader of the Tormentors is an album that to me is pretty far down in uh, Morrissey's catalog, at least when I ranked the studio albums a long time ago on this channel. But that tour, Ringleader of the Tormentors, that tour was awesome. That might have actually been my second favorite tour that I ever saw in terms of his performance and the set list. Uh, after that, I saw the Swords Tour in 2009. Uh, that played in Seattle. Also, I saw that tour in Seattle. Now, I, I'm pretty sure it was the Swords Tour. I, I almost think that the Year's Refusal Tour missed Seattle, but we did see the Swords Tour. I love that Swords compilation. Year's of Refusal is, I mean, to me, that's the last best uh, Morrissey album is Years of Refusal and then Swords. I love that record as well. I love that tour. That was a great set list. Uh, I didn't see him after that for five years. I sort of, I didn't take a break from Morrissey in that time, but, you know, I had a, a situation in my personal life where my, I had this ex-girlfriend who just hated Morrissey. She made it not even fun to be a fan. She made it not even fun to listen to. So I took basically five years off from seeing him live. So I saw him back in 2014 on the World Peace Tour in San Jose, California, that was another tour. That was probably, of all the tours that I've seen and all the shows that I've seen, that was probably my least favorite show. Uh, for one thing, World Peace is None of Your Business is still an album that I don't really have a super strong you know, opinion on. I think it is an album that, in a lot of ways, it just kind of sits there. It's got a lot of interesting you know, musical influence on it, and it's a record that I would say over the past year or so is slowly, very slowly starting to grow on me, but the record is 10 years old now, which I can't even believe the record is 10 years old. But seeing that tour, you know, I didn't necessarily love that album. Uh, and of all the shows I've seen, I've never seen Morrissey put on a bad show. And I, I know he's capable of putting on a bad show. It's hard to imagine because I've always had really good luck in terms of the shows I've been to, but... This show in San Jose for the World Peace Tour, it was in San Jose. And I just kind of got the sense that Morrissey was somewhere else in his head. Now, this was San Jose. And I don't know if you've ever been to San Jose, California, how familiar you are with the city of San Jose. But when you're in San Jose, it's just hard to imagine that you aren't anywhere else. The one thing that stood out to me about the World Peace Show in 2014 was he played the song Asleep, which... I mean, I almost fell over when he went into the song Asleep, and he played it like note perfect. That was just one. Of, that's just one of those songs that you just don't assume that you're ever going to get a chance to see live, and he played that song just spot on perfect. Uh, definitely the high point of that show. I also remember that show in San Jose being cut short during the encore because during the encore, the crowd just rushed the stage, and he took off, understandably. Uh, then I saw the high school tour in San Francisco, and I saw the California Sun tour uh, in San Francisco as well. And then, of course, this past year, I saw the 40th anniversary tour both here in 
uh, Memphis and Nashville. And as I said before, I'm just really super excited about this tour coming up. I always get super amped, like I mentioned before. You know, I didn't go to these Las Vegas shows uh, that happened this summer. And after I didn't go to these shows in Las Vegas over the summer, I had a little bit of seller's remorse. You know, I felt like I kind of missed out, especially considering, you know, how good he looked and sounded and everything I heard and read about the shows was just spot on. It's always like, oh man, you know, you missed out on seeing an opportunity, like I said earlier, seeing Morrissey live at this point in time, especially now that he's coming to my area, is just not something that I'm willing to miss because we are in such a finite amount of shows left in Morrissey's career. And I'm not saying that to be grim or funny or dark, but it's just the truth. I mean, the amount of shows that Morrissey has ahead of him are much less than those he has behind him. That's just simple math. But as soon as this, this tour was announced in August, this sort of little fall run that he's going to be doing out here, I suddenly felt a little bit better. I suddenly felt like, okay, I missed out, but I will have an opportunity uh, to make up for not seeing those shows in Las Vegas. And for me, you know, as soon as the tickets go on sale, as soon as the tour is announced, I just get this jolt uh, of excitement. I can't wait to get my tickets. As soon as the tickets are purchased and in my hands, of course, now we don't have physical tickets anymore. Typically, they are uh, on your phone. Although I will say that when we went to go see the 40th anniversary tour in Memphis at the Elvis Presley soundstage, they still had physical tickets, which I have mine framed from that night in Memphis. So that was actually something that was kind of cool. I know I'm an old man, and when you value things like that, it makes you look like an old man, but I'm always excited when I get my tickets. We are at that point in the process right now where I am just amped. I'm thinking about this show, thinking about these two shows, and as the days approach, of course, you know, I have a hard time sleeping at night, which isn't uncommon for me. I tend to be insomnia Johnson as it is. And yes, I acknowledge that I am a man in his 40s and it's a little bit pathetic to get this excited for still seeing your favorite recording artists when they come to your town. But I can't help it, man. I live for this stuff. I don't have children. This is what I live for. And the day of the show, I'm always very excited. Now my wife and I will be driving down to Birmingham the day of the show in Birmingham, I know that I will just be racking my brain trying to figure out what songs he's going to play, what songs he's not going to play. And I do this thing, I try to do this thing, and I make an effort to do it this time, where, you know, the few days before the show that I'm going to, because this tour starts just a few days before the show, the first show in Birmingham, I'm going to sort of stay away from social media. I try to go into these shows as blind as possible when it comes to the set list. I kind of like to imagine what he's going to play. Now, there are songs I always assume are going to get played. There are songs I assume are not going to get played. There are songs that I definitely always want to hear, and there are songs that I sort of don't necessarily want to hear. Now, there aren't any songs in Morrissey's catalog that I hate enough to just be appalled if he were to play live. Now, there are certainly songs in Morrissey's catalog that I could definitely never hear, or songs I could definitely never hear again. But I know as the date approaches, especially as my wife and I are driving down to Birmingham on the day of the show, I'm just going to be racking my brain trying to figure out what he's going to play, uh, where he's going to play them in the set list, and stuff I want to hear, stuff that I don't want to hear. And for me, every time when I get to the show, I grab my swag first thing. You know, I go find my space, and I just sit, and I wait with just... I mean, literally on pins and needles. And for me, and again, this will be my 13th and 14th show. I'm a man that is middle-aged. I realize that this sounds pathetic, but every time uh, Morrissey comes out on stage, it has the same effect on me. I feel as if my blood is electrified. I feel energetic. I feel alive. And for that hour and a half, two hours, whatever it is, uh, nothing else in the world matters. Everything else in the world is just peaches and cream and to me that is what it's all about when it comes to going and seeing music and having a relationship with an artist a favorite artist i always find people's relationships with their favorite artists to be fascinating even if it, even if it is an artist that i don't necessarily endorse and there's just something about morrissey there's something about his music there's something about his voice there's something about his lyrics that i connect with like no other artist. I've said this before. My second favorite artist of all time is 
Probably David Bowie, although it fluctuates from time to time. I'd say over the past couple of years, it's been David Bowie. It's been Echo and the Bunny Men in the past. It's been the Jam, Paul Weller. There's been a few people that have sort of, sort of snuck into my number two spot. But at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter because even David Bowie, as great as he is, is so far beneath Morrissey that at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. There's just something about Morrissey that I connect to. There's something in his lyrics. There's something in his voice that touches me the way that no other artist ever has. And every time I see him live, it is the same exact feeling. I feel that same exact excitement I do uh, as I did back in 1997, as I did in 2023. And as I'm assuming I will uh, in just a couple of weeks when he is out here in Birmingham and Knoxville. Now, when it comes to the set list and things that I do hope to hear and things I hope not to hear. I mean, the last thing, the, the only thing I can really sort of reference is the last two sort of tours or shows that Morrissey has really played and kind of go through and see things that I would want to see or things that I would change out. Now, the show in Nashville that I saw on the 40th anniversary tour, uh, I thought the set list was decent. There was definitely some things that I would have changed about it now. One of the things about the set list for the 40th anniversary tour was, you know, I thought that he would go a little bit deeper into his catalog. I didn't expect it to be so much of a sort of typical, you know, greatest hits uh, kind of set list. I mean, you know, when you have a career that is 40 years long and you have all of the albums and just all of the material that Morrissey has produced throughout his career, you obviously can't expect to hear everything. You can't have every single album be represented, and I thought he did a decent job of touching on a lot of the different eras of his career, although for the Nashville 40th anniversary and Memphis, uh, I thought that the show was a little bit too greatest hitsy, if I could. I would have preferred, you know, a little bit of deeper material. I mean, that's one cool thing about seeing Morrissey all these years later is, you know, typically he still surprises you. There's still songs that he busts out that I don't expect to hear. Uh, this show in Nashville, I didn't necessarily have too many surprises. I mean, Morrissey's always preached that he feels as if he should be able to bring out any song during his catalog any night and be able to perform it uh, as well as it should be. And I feel like he always does the stuff that he does bring out. He always performs as well as you would hope. Uh, but in Nashville, at least in um, October of last year, he started off uh, the set with the song uh, We Hate It When Our Friends Become Successful. The night before this in Memphis, this song was the uh, encore, which the night in Memphis, uh, I was beginning to wonder if he was going to totally omit the album, Your Arsenal, because Successful was the only song that he played off of Your Arsenal, at least on those shows in Memphis and Nashville. And I was really wondering towards the end of that show in Memphis, the first night, if he was going to completely leave out uh, Your Arsenal off the set list because your arsenal is an all-time classic and he played the song we hate it when our friends become successful which is a song i like it's not necessarily my favorite song of all time if you're only going to pick one song off of you are the quarry i mean or your arsenal i mean that is not the song that i would choose uh so i would pick anything over pretty much you know let's not get nuts here Pretty much anything over We Hate It When Our Friends Become Successful over uh, your arsenal at this point in time. Uh, after that, he played Our Frank from Kill Uncle. Uh, the night before in Memphis, he did not play Kill Uncle. He opened the show in uh, Memphis with an Elvis Presley cover, uh, which he did not play in Nashville the next night. That was the only song that he didn't play on both nights, and he sub uh, substituted it the next night with uh, Our Frank in Nashville. Our Frank is a great song. I love it. At this point in time, again, if you're only playing one song off of Kill Uncle, which is an album I love. I don't understand why some people just don't dig on Kill Uncle as much as I do. It was an album that was a slow burn for me. When I first started listening to Kill Uncle, it didn't grab me right away. But now it's an album that I absolutely love. Uh, so, But Our Frank, I love it. I love that song, man. But at this point in time, man, I'd rather hear Mute Witness. I'd rather hear, there's a lot of stuff. Driving Your Girlfriend Home is a song I'd rather hear off of uh, Kill Uncle, at least at this point in time. Uh, after that, he played Suedehead, which, of course, is uh, sort of a big crowd pleaser. 
I love Suede Head. It's a song that I do love. It's not a song that I'm overly tired of. But at this point in time, man, just trade it out. I could I could not see Suede Head again live, and I think I would survive just fine. You take Suede Head out of the set list. You put in something that's a little bit deeper, something that hasn't been just beaten to death. I'd be happy. I'm happy hearing Suede Head also, but uh, after that, he played Alma Matters, which, again... Maladjusted is an album that I really like a lot. Uh, I actually think I like Maladjusted a lot more than a lot of people in the Morrissey fan community. That being said, I like uh, Southpaw Grammar much less than most people in the Morrissey fan community. Southpaw Grammar is easily my least favorite album uh, in Morrissey's catalog. And Alma Matters is a song I like. I do. I like it. Steve, it's a great tune. But if you're only playing one song off Maladjusted, you got to trade this one out. I mean, this song has run its course, uh, as far as I'm concerned. If you're playing only one song off of uh, Maladjusted, to me, trade this one out for Ammunition. Ammunition, to me, is my favorite song off of Maladjusted. Pretty much always has been. Uh, after that, he played Stop Me. If you think you've heard this one before, no complaints there. Uh, I love that song. Always have. I, you know, I'm never going to quibble about seeing Smith's material live. Uh, after that, he played I Wish You Lonely off of Low in High School, which isn't necessarily my favorite song off Low in High School, but this song live is The Jugs. This is one of my favorite newer live songs in Morrissey's catalog, so I have no problem with that one being in there. Uh, half, a, half a Person, I mean, that one is just a no-brainer. I mean, I love Half a Person. I never get tired of hearing it. Uh, after that, he played Let Me Kiss You, which is cool. Anything off of You Are the Quarry is going to fly pretty high. Uh, for me, Let Me Kiss You is a great song. I mean, You Are the Quarry is one of those albums that doesn't have a bad second. So I would that's one that I would, wouldn't mind singing again live. How Soon Is Now after that. Another song I love. I love How Soon Is Now. Never really get tired of it. It Occasionally, very occasionally, if it comes on and shuffle in my car, sometimes it's a skipper, but most of the time not. I would just throw this song in with Suedehead and say, you know, it's a great tune. If you ever do anything with Morrissey and Marr, bring this song out of retirement. Let Johnny Marr destroy it on the guitar. But until then, you can kind of retire how soon is now. I think most of us who are the diehard fans uh, have seen and heard that song enough. I love it. Don't get me wrong. Bring it back if you and Morrissey, you and Mar can ever sort of bury the hatchet and make something work. Not something that I'm necessarily praying for, mind you, especially with all of the drama in 2024 between those two guys. You, you kind of feel like a kid who's in the middle of this ugly divorce. You know, your parents have been divorced 30 years and they're still like chirping at each other. It's what it feels like being a Smiths fan sometimes with Morrissey and Mar in this back and forth. It just stop. Stop. Celebrate the legacy. You were the greatest band of all time. There's no pressure to come back. It'd be a big cash grab, but there's no pressure, really. But man, if you guys could come back and how soon is now with Johnny Marr and Morrissey? Yeah, I'm all in. Uh, after that, he played, of course, the telephone rings. Not digging it. Not digging that song at all. In fact, the fact that I've seen this song live twice now but as of yet, have not seen Rebels Without Applause is just criminal. Because Rebels Without Applause, I would make the argument, is one of the best songs that Morrissey's done in the last like decade. Of course, The Telephone Rings does nothing for me. I almost just, I don't like the song. I'm sort of hoping that when the Bonfire of Teenagers record sees the light of day, which it will, which it will, at the end of the day, it will. I'm definitely hoping that the record is more... Rebels Without Applause, and less, of course, the telephone rings, because I don't like the song at all. And Morrissey is pimping it uh, just to death. Now, I understand you like the song. You believe in it. It's your new material. It's exciting. But not on this tour. Throw this one out. Give us some Rebels Without Applause. I want to see that song live really bad. Uh, after that, he played The Loop, which I love. Uh, Darling, I hug a pillow. Awesome. No complaints there. After that, Girlfriend in a Coma. It's time to go with The Girlfriend in a Coma, Steve. This is a song that I don't hate. 
I've mentioned this before in the past. It's an okay song. It's fun. It's a novelty. It's cute. It's clever. For some reason, people still love it. For me, please, please, trade this song out for something that hasn't been played to death. Now, I get Girlfriend at Home is easy. It's a cute, little, fun, easy song to get through. The crowd always reacts positively to it. I'm probably in the minority. But just no Girlfriend at Home on this tour, please. Uh, after that, he did a Halen, uh, Halen, a Waylon Jennings song called Are You Sure Hank Done It This Way? Uh, he played the song in both Memphis and Nashville. It's an old Waylon Jennings country song, a cover. Uh, no, I don't want to hear this song again. For one thing, I'm not a big country music guy. Now, granted, Waylon Jennings is cool. He's authentic, real country. But I mean, come on, man. I live in Nashville, right? I have country music shoved down my throat all day, every day. Now, granted, typically, it's the shitty Jason Aldean, Kenny Chesney, you know, Alan Jackson, pop bullshit. Well, Waylon Jennings was legitimate. I understand that. There's a big difference. I just don't want to hear country music anymore. In fact, this reminds me of a friend of mine I used to have back when I lived in Seattle, and this guy was a music snob. I mean, you talk about a punk rock elitist douche. This guy was it. But his wife, who was a lovely gal, was obsessed with that sort of Jason Aldean, Kenny Chesney, shitty pop country. And she was very knowledgeable about music. It wasn't that she wasn't knowledgeable about music. That just happened to be her luggage. And my friend, who was this elitist snob, was always forced to take his wife to go see these artists, such as Kenny Chesney, you know, and Jason Aldean, and George Strait, and all of this just putrefied, terrible country music. And I used to tell him, man, I was like, dude, you have you know, proven to me what true love is. You have inspired me on what it means to be a good, dutiful husband, because if you can go sit through Kenny Chesney at a football stadium, your wife should never question your devotion again. But, you know, I don't want to hear this song. Waylon Jennings is fine. I get it. He's not Kenny Chesney. He's the real deal. But the thing is, too, this song bombed in both Memphis and Nashville. I was a little bit surprised this song sort of tanked in Nashville because you know, it mentions the word Nashville in the song, for one thing. And also, Waylon Jennings is a big thing here. Memphis, yeah, it made sense. Memphis isn't really a country music town, but it kind of surprised me that the song bombed out here uh, in Nashville. But no, I don't want to hear it. Something else. Bring in a, in a bring in one of your songs. We don't need covers. He also, the first night in Memphis, I think I mentioned this, but he did a Elvis cover that just went over like a lead balloon also. <laughs> Get it? Uh, after that, he played Please, Please, Please Let Me Get What I Want. Yeah, I hear that every time. Uh, no complaints. I don't necessarily want to hear it every time, but, you know, no complaints there. After that, he played Every Day is Like Sunday. I don't know what to tell you. It's the greatest song of all time. I always want to hear it every show I go to. I want to hear Every Day is Like Sunday. I haven't seen it at every show I've been to. In fact, I would say of the shows I've been to, my dozen... I've seen it less times than I have. Not saying I leave feeling gypped if I don't see it, but it's just one of those songs I always want to see. It's the greatest song of all time. I realize it's not exactly a deep cut. I understand that. It's probably a very generic choice, but it just happens to be my favorite song ever. Uh, after that, he played Speedway. I always want to hear that. I always want to hear uh, Speedway. That's one of the greatest live songs of all time. That is the live music video for the song Speedway. It's my favorite Morrissey video of all time. After that, he played Jack the Ripper, which is one of my favorite uh, Morrissey live songs ever. I love the production of it. At this show in Nashville, actually, though, he uh, played this song as the last song for his set. Now, the night before this, in Memphis, he played uh, Jack the Ripper as the encore. and I mean, it's just one of the greatest live songs of all time. The production, Morrissey's voice, everything, it just is top notch. But the night in Nashville at the Fisher Center, he set off so much smoke that it actually 
uh, triggered the smoke alarm in the building and the house lights came up and the PA went off and the, it totally killed the song, killed the whole stage production, but I, I love that song. I never don't want to see uh, Jack the Ripper. After that, he played the uh, one song encore, which was Irish Blood, English Heart, which is another song that I just never get tired of. Anything off You Are the Quarry uh, is something that I'm excited to see live now. These shows in Las Vegas back in July... This was just the first show, July 26th. I'm not going to go through all of them, but he started off the show with Big Mouth Strikes Again. That's a song I always love seeing live. That's one that apparently he hadn't played in many years up until these uh, Las Vegas shows. After that, he played uh, You're the One for Me, Fatty, which to me is another one of those songs that I don't love. It is sort of the solo equivalent to me of Girlfriend in a Coma. It's a funny, cute sort of novelty song. I love the video for You're the One for Me, Fatty, but if you're playing stuff off of uh, your arsenal, that is not necessarily something that I want to hear. I have one rule for Morrissey when it comes to writing a set list. He breaks that rule during this set list on July 26th. That is, you cannot play Girlfriend in a Coma and You're the One for Me, Fatty on the same night. You can't do it. I'm not going to tolerate it. That's the one rule. That is the one stipulation I have. For you is that you can't play both those show songs on the same night uh he played i wish you lonely which we talked about um gang lord after that which is a song that i i think i've seen gang lord live let's try to think about this when the set list came out i i have all my set list written down somewhere of shows i've been to i think i've seen gang lord i love that song uh how can you possibly know how i feel is awesome he played that course the telephone rings i mentioned i don't like that song uh then after that he played if you don't like me don't look at me from swords which man that is one that actually surprised me just going back and reading this set list like i said before morrissey is very good at bringing it back songs back to life and sort of surprising you with some of the stuff he plays on these on these tours and these shows and that is one that i would love to see live uh he played crashing boars which is awesome he followed that up with i like you these shows in las vegas in july and august i feel like he went a little bit heavy into you're the quarry and i'm curious as to if the reason why he did that was because of the shows that had gotten canceled in the beginning of the year in southern california not saying that i know that that's the case but that's sort of my inkling is that he went a little bit deeper into you were the quarry because those shows got canceled. Those shows were, uh, these songs were probably uh, freshly rehearsed and ready to go. Um, after that, he played Munich Air Disaster 1958. Another song off of Swords that I would love to see live. I actually don't think I've seen that one uh, live. Then Half a Person, Let Me Kiss You. Girlfriend in a Coma, as I mentioned before, this show he did both Girlfriend in a Coma and Fatty. You can't do that on the same night, son. Um, why don't you find out for yourself? Awesome. Uh, the loop, please, please. Um, he did play, uh, in July in Vegas. He also played, I will see you in far off places, which I believe in Nashville and Memphis on the 40th anniversary tour. I don't think he played anything off of ringleader, the tormentor. So, uh, that was cool seeing, um, I did see the, uh, I watched some of the far off places, uh, at least, per, uh, performance online so judging based on these two set lists of his more recent shows there's some stuff on here i would definitely love to see again there's definitely some stuff on here i would like to see him uh, sort of trade out but i'm just so excited about these shows one thing i'm excited about real quick before we get out of here also is to see the current band again i saw this band on the 40th anniversary tour out here in memphis and nashville it is a band that i've sort of heard and read Mixed reviews of some people aren't necessarily in love with the current band. I think that they sound okay. Uh, good, in fact. I don't think that this is the worst band that I've ever heard. But it certainly is not the greatest band in Morrissey's solo uh, career. Of course, that is the classic Morrissey band. The band which features Boz Bohr, Alan White, Gary Day, and Spencer Coburn. You know, at some point in time, I would love to see Morrissey get back together uh, with that band. To me, that is my second favorite band of all time behind only the smiths but i actually kind of liked this band that he had uh on the 40th anniversary tour i thought that they sounded pretty good definitely not as good 
uh, as some other bands I've heard, but much better than some of the reviews uh, I have read from people who have seen him with this uh, current band. But these shows are coming up very quickly. Hopefully, uh, not everything goes off uh, as planned. And I would be surprised, actually, because I do get the sense that Morrissey is aware that this is somewhat of a important tour for him, like I said, kind of in 2024 uh, on a high note. I would actually be very surprised. Now, I'm not shockable, and nothing Morrissey does can really shock you, but I would be surprised if uh, anything, if any of these shows end up getting canceled. I'm assuming that the tickets uh, for these shows have sold very well, at least throughout the cities that he is hitting on this tour. This is sort of an interesting uh, geographic tour, but you know, I think it will be I think it will be great. I think these are going to be good shows. I would be very surprised, like I said, if he messes with any of these tour dates, if he cancels this. It's something that would would surprise me. So hopefully uh, you'll be seeing this tour if it comes to one of these areas near you. I will be seeing this tour in uh, Little or Birmingham, Knoxville, and hopefully Indianapolis, not Little Rock. I can guarantee you that I will not be in Little Rock. But coming up after... My experience at these shows. For Morrissey coming up, I will be back here on Archaic Records giving you a show recap. I know that you probably just pissed your pants with excitement. So I will leave you now. Allow you to tell yourself off, contain your excitement, and just tell you that I very much appreciate you checking out this video. This is Archaic Records. My name is Jamie, coming at you from Nashville, Tennessee. Be sure to check back most weeks for Morrissey Monday, a celebration of all things Morrissey and the Smiths. Be sure to go out and support your local record store. Check back most weeks for Morrissey Monday, a celebration of all week of all things Morrissey and the Smiths and other record content and album reviews throughout the week. I'm pretty sure I botched the ending of this recording, but what can I say? I stink! Uh, anyway, I think that that's just about going to do her. So until next time, my friends. Talk to you then.